So this is the story of the drenched man. And this is how I will tell it to you. Our story begins with a young man, a young man holding a lantern so that he can see under the floorboards to the treasure that lies beneath. And a smile forms upon his lips as he thinks of the wealth that he can look forward to. But that smile is only momentary and that vision of the contraband, the smuggled goods that were hidden under the floorboards were the last things to imprint upon the back of his eyes as the pommel of the sword cracked his skull and his eyes went dim and his body folded. Hours earlier, Sir Arthur Darrell had dismissed his servants. Now, in a castle the size of Scotney Castle, which you can see behind me, you don't need many servants. And Sir Arthur Darrell had no family living in the castle. And he told his servants to take the day, no, to take the day and take the evening, for they could go and celebrate the gathering of the apple harvest, which was an important harvest and remains an important harvest in the county of Kent in the south of England. And so the servants went out of the castle, not through the back door, but through the main door and over the moat, cheering and cheerful. And at the back of the group followed the castle steward. And as Sir Arthur Darrell closed the door on the back of the steward, the steward looked over his shoulder and caught Sir Arthur's eye. And the steward almost imperceptibly nodded. And Sir Arthur returned the gesture and then closed the door. Once he was alone, he sat down in the great hall next to the fire, picked up a book and read and waited and waited and waited till the hammering came on the great door of the castle. Sir Arthur smiled to himself and placed the book down, putting a bookmark so that he could pick it up again and enjoy his read. He went to the castle door, no servants, of course, to open it. So he opened it himself to find five officers of the customs. And the captain at the front said, Sir Arthur, you will forgive this intrusion, but so we have intelligence that there may be some contraband hidden somewhere in your castle. Now, the revenue men had been keeping watch on Scotney Castle for weeks. They'd been watching every route in and every route out of the castle estate, but they'd seen nothing that could incriminate Sir Arthur. Of course, if they'd known about the tunnel that was three miles long, traveling from Scotney Castle to the ruins of Bayham Abbey, just over the border in Sussex, then it might have been a different story. But of that route, they had no knowledge. And Sir Arthur simply held the door open for them and in they came. And they searched the castle from top to bottom, from ceiling to cellar. They pulled out barrels, they overturned sacks, they pulled furniture from the walls to look for secret doors, they opened coffers and emptied them of candles and of linen, they turned the, curse, the castle upside down for four hours and found absolutely nothing. And so the captain could do nothing but through gritted teeth apologize to Sir Arthur for the disturbance and assure Sir Arthur that his servants would be able to put the castle back in order once they had gone. And the men left through the castle door and over the drawbridge of the moat and 
climbed back upon their horses and rode off into the trees. Sir Arthur Darrell closed the door, went back to the fire, sat down, and picked up his book, which he had marked to the right place, and continued reading. For eventually the servants would come home, of course, a little merry, perhaps, but at least they would not have been there for this intrusion. Sir Arthur was reading about an hour after the revenue men had left when there was hammering on the door once more. Now the servants wouldn't have needed to hammer on the door. So Sir Arthur put the book down again and walked over and opened the door to the castle. And there was standing one of the revenue men, a young man who'd been at the back of the group of five and had followed what his compatriots had done and had entered into the search and then had left. But now here he was, standing with a lantern, smiling at Sir Arthur. And he said to Sir Arthur, my lord, you will excuse this intrusion. I know the sun has set and the moon is sitting high. But, my lord, you will understand me when I say, I think we may have missed a spot. We may have missed a special place in your castle. Will you allow me to come in? Now, you and I probably have watched enough police TV programs and films to know that a police officer never goes on their own into a search. This revenue man was on his own. And Sir Arthur allowed him in and closed the castle door behind him. And to Sir Arthur's discomfort, he saw that the young man didn't look around for a place to search. He simply turned and headed towards the stairs. Sir Arthur watched as the young man's shadow from his lantern went up the panelling of the staircase. And then he heard the young man calling, Sir Arthur, will you not come with me? Sir Arthur followed the young man up the stairs, strapping his sword over his tunic as he went. He followed the young man all the way to the top of the castle, to the high gallery, a long gallery that you could use to take exercise in. And the gallery was lit by windows through which the full moon was shining, creating puddles of cool blue light. Again, Sir Arthur was disturbed to see that the young man didn't look around him in the gallery at all. He simply stalked from the end where the stairs came up into the gallery to the opposite end and then looked down at the floor and the boards and the joins between the boards. And then he took out his sword, and with the tip of his sword, he started to lever one of the boards. And there was a click. And the young man, without even turning to look at Sir Arthur Darrell, said, My lord, is this the time to start talking about a price? For my lord, I do not want to leave here empty-handed. For tonight, I become your partner, my lord. And he lifted his sword, and as he did so, the trap door opened. Now, beneath the floor was not just a hole, it was actually a room. And this room, you can still see, if you go to Scotney Castle now, had been used as a priest hole. And Father Blount, in the 16th century, had used it for seven years to look after the Catholic community of Scotney, until he eventually escaped in 1598 as the Protestant authorities arrived. So it was big enough to house a man comfortably and big enough to take a lot of tea and brandy and every contraband good that you would want 
and would not wish to pay tax upon. And the young man looked down into the hole and said, my, my, Sir Arthur, what a treasure. And what have we got here? So he picked up his lantern and looked into the hole. And as he looked into the hole, he realized that he needed to take his hat off to have a proper look. And he took his hat off. And as he put it on the floorboards next to him, there was a clunk. For as he took the hat off, he took the iron lining that was in the hat off at the same time. And then we know what happened, for I've already told you. And the last sight of that treasure could not have given him comfort as the pummel of the sword cracked his skull and he folded. He was still breathing, but I don't know of what consciousness he had of what was happening to him, because if he had any consciousness, he would have felt himself being pulled along the length of the floorboards of the high gallery until he heard the sound of windows being opened. He would have felt himself being manhandled up. And then if he had consciousness, he would have felt fleetingly the freedom of flight and the cool air on his skin until he hit the hard, cold water of the moat. And of course, he was a revenue man. He'd had a sword with him. His hat had an iron lining and he was wearing a protective coat, a padded coat, padded with wool. And the wool drank the waters of the moat and pulled the young man down to muddy death. When the servants returned, they found Sir Arthur sitting by his fire reading his book. The steward went up to his lord and said, my lord, did we have visitors? And Sir Arthur said, we had visitors, but we have no problem. But he took the steward aside, and if you had been watching, you would have noticed the steward later on carrying a lantern and a bucket and a scrubbing rush up to the high gallery quite late. The next day, the castle, Scotney Castle was back to its normal, brisk and busy self. The day carried on as it would any other day. And the evening came and Sir Arthur sat down to a meal. And as he sat down to a meal, approximately 24 hours after the events that I have narrated, there was a hammering on the castle door. Now, the day before, Sir Arthur had gone to the door himself because there were no servants. Now there were servants. And so a servant went to the castle door and opened it and then came back to report to his lord. And Sir Arthur said, who is it? Who is at the door? And the servant said, no one, my lord. There was no one at the door, just a puddle of water in the shape of footprints. And the door, my lord, looked as if someone had been leaning on it, someone, someone who had been caught in a heavy storm, for it was drenched, my lord. Sir Arthur composed himself and simply said to his servant, forget everything you have seen. The next night, as Sir Arthur was sitting down to eat, he was a little nervous. And sure enough, 24 hours after the previous knocking, came knocking at the door. A different servant went to the door, and when he came back, his report was the same. A puddle of water in the shape of footprints. And a water, a door covered in water as if someone had been leaning against it who had been caught in a storm. 
The next night, Sir Arthur was gripping onto the table, his food untouched before him. As the hammering came on the door once more, this time he said, leave it! I will go myself. Sir Arthur went to the door. And when he opened it, the scream woke everyone in the castle from whatever they were doing. And when the servants ran to the door, they found Sir Arthur curled up, sobbing in front of the open and empty door, drenched in water. The next day, Sir Arthur Darrell packed all that he needed and traveled from Scotney Castle, leaving his home behind him and traveling to France to get away from the castle, to get away from the drenched man. But the drenched man filled his dreams and Sir Arthur Darrell never slept a full night's sleep without waking in a bed soaked with sweat, soaked as if he had been caught in a storm. And in 1720, in the middle of December, his coffin was returned to Scotney and lowered into the floor of the parish church. But, there is an additional story to go with the burial of Sir Arthur. For as the mourners were standing around the coffin as it was lowered into the floor, there was a figure at the back of them dressed in a black cloak with the hood up. And the figure was heard to say, that is me they think they are burying. So was that the spectre of Sir Arthur? Was that Sir Arthur himself? Who knows? But Scotney Castle is now a National Trust property. And you can visit it and have coffee and walnut cake and a piece of, and a cup of tea. But be warned that right up until the present day, tourists visiting the, car visiting the castle have occasionally reported seeing a man knocking on the castle door, drenched, as if he had been caught in a heavy storm or had been drowned in the moat. And there is one final twist to this story. At the end of the 19th century, there was to be a funeral in Scotney Parish Church and they needed to dig down under the floor. The sexton lifted the stone and found a coffin. And when he opened it, it was full of stones. So you can make up your own mind. But if you go to Scotney Castle, and do, because it's very beautiful, just be very wary if you see any puddles by the door. And that is the story of the drenched man, and that is how I have told it to you.